We're um, resuming with our final of five sessions today in our, our topic of discovering the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, just a quick recap um, of where we've been uh, on our, on our five-week journey. We started um, by looking the first week at the discovery of the scrolls, discoveries in antiquity, discoveries in 1947 to 1952, and kind of the phenomenon of uh, scroll translation and scroll transmission to the scholarly and to the popular community. Uh, then we looked um, at the Dead Sea Scrolls in the Bible for a session, what we can learn about the Bible from the Dead Sea Scrolls, which are by far the oldest manuscripts that we have of the Bible, uh, as well as how people uh, read the Bible in the Second Temple period, the period that the scrolls come from, uh, and they read it in ways that were very different from the way that maybe we would think of reading it today. Um, our third session, uh, we focused on the Essene community, uh, the community that is um, hypothesized to have produced the scrolls. Uh, it's a strong hypothesis. There are people that uh, have other views, and we'll be talking about some of those, the most unusual other views today um, as part of our discussion on controversies. But uh, we looked uh, at the, the Qumran community and their lifestyle, uh, their beliefs, uh, and the way that they practice Judaism in, in, in their world. Um, and then last week, um, we dealt with um, uh, kind of the, the theologies and the, the ideologies, the ideas, religious ideas that were important uh, in the Second Temple period and the way that we find the expression of those ideas in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, we looked at su subjects like angels. Uh, we looked at demons. Um, we looked at fate and free will. Uh, we looked at the way that the Essene community or the community of the Dead Sea Scrolls fits in. Uh, with other sects of Judaism that we know about from other sources, historical and literary and, and religious. Uh, and so finally today, um, we're moving on to kind of the odds and ends, um, but uh, oriented along kind of a framing of what I call mysteries, secrets, and lies. And this is um, uh, just a, a brief journey through some of the controversies, uh, some of the scandals, uh, some of the strange ideas about the scrolls. And I think it is important to discuss these things because um, if you were to access um, information about the scrolls in a wide variety of different forms of popular media, whether that's documentaries on uh, networks like the History Channel or the Travel Channel or um, on Netflix or uh, in the context of maybe books that you would find on an end cap at Barnes and Noble, these are uh, the ideas that you would encounter maybe as frequently as the as the kind of the historically uh, um, uh, sensible scholarly uh, consensus about things. And so I think it is worthwhile just to talk about these ideas and maybe put them to bed. So if you see, you know, uh, some questions uh, come up from a friend or from a TV show or something like that, you can you can sort of understand um, what scholars think about some of these ideas. Uh, and then finally, I'll, I'll just end with a question. And it's a question that, um, I mean, we know who owns the scrolls as a matter of law, but I, I would encourage us at the, at the end of our conversation to think about who they belong to um, and the various um, ways that we can think about uh, ownership, belonging, and, and cultural uh, patrimony through uh, the scrolls. Um, today's talk is roughly organized into three parts. Um, the first part deals with uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls and early Christianity. And as I've mentioned a couple of times in previous sessions, uh, there was a great hope and a great disappointment um, when the scrolls were first discovered. Uh, it was hoped that a great deal more could be learned about the development of Christianity through um, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, maybe the Christian scrolls would be found or we would get new ideas from Second Temple Judaism. And there has been some insightful uh, information discovered, but uh, not in the, in the way that maybe scholars in the popular community has hoped for. Um, and that's kind of bred some conspiracy theories, which I will talk about. Um, the second thing is I wanna go into a little bit of a archeological um, uh, diversion into the strangest of all the scrolls, which is this thing called the, the Copper Scroll, um, which is a treasure map. Uh, and so it lends itself as well to all kinds of, uh, all kinds of ideas of um, you know, crazy and maybe just crazy enough to be true. Um, and then finally, I'll talk about um, some of the scandals 
um, that are currently going around. Like if you were to read the news about the scrolls in 2021, 2022, um, you would be hearing about these specific um, kind of scandals and they involve um, for the most part forgeries. Um, so that will be the subject of our, our three-part discussion today. Um, by the way, um, if, if you haven't figured this out yet, the, our transition slides are the copper scroll. So that's the copper scroll as it was found in situ. I will come back to the copper scroll uh, quite a bit uh, during this session. But uh, if you've ever, if you've been wondering what what that is, it's it's the copper scroll. Um, so there were a variety, I, as I mentioned, there's no Christian texts found at Qumran, um, at, at least Christian texts as we know them, uh, texts that talk about um, Jesus or even other figures from the New Testament, like John the Baptist, or, um, you know, have unique sayings that we know from the teachings of the of the, the early New Testament figures or anything like that. There's really nothing quite found like that. Um, but where there are connections uh, is in the realm of ideas. And so I will show um, some ideas uh, and and the connections that can be made with with certain ideas. Um, it, uh, in order to kind of connect with these ideas, we have to talk a little bit about um, early Christianity as well. So I'll share uh, when needed just a little bit about um, uh, you know specific texts or specific connections that that might be made there. Um, but uh, the, the consensus that people have, I think, come to over the last um, several decades now is that um, a lot of these ideas are just kind of floating around in the religious atmosphere of the Second Temple period, and that maybe the Qumran community, the Dead Sea Scrolls community, um, and the early um, Jesus movement are accessing these ideas independently from each other in the broader kind of world of ideas of Hellenistically influenced Second Temple Judaism. Um, but the connections that we see, um, I've kind of grouped these, um, grouped these uh, into um, what I call messianic texts, uh, texts about the Messiah, the anointed king of, of Israel that is um, uh, talked about in a lot of biblical and Second Temple literature in different ways. Um, I'll talk about potential connections to certain community figures. Um, and then we will we'll kind of go off the ranch um, and uh, talk about some unconventional theories and even some conspiracy theories uh, that arise from the desire to um, draw stronger connections between um, uh, particular ideas about Christian origins and the scrolls uh, than may actually make sense in the in the uh, with the with the data that we have. Um, yeah, so um, the, the first thing I think, which maybe talk about what when I say um, the Messiah, um, Mashiach in Hebrew, um, uh, what we mean uh, by that uh, in, in, the, in the context of, of the scrolls. And so this is where it is used in many, many different ways. Um, but when, we, when we're talking about the term in sort of the study of Second Temple Judaism, um, we mean a, a, a biblical concept that's shared among a variety of groups in the Second Temple period. Um, these ideas um, are in some ways distinct from one another, um, but um, we kind of, in the modern sense, we access um, a collapsing of categories of what the uh, Messiah might be um, just because both Christianity um, you know, Christianity, the answer that, you know, I, you know, will joke that the Sunday school answer is Jesus to every question. Um, you know, in Christianity, um, every category kind of collapses onto the idea of Jesus. Um, and then in the early rabbinic um, period, they also, their sensibilities about a Messiah are somewhat also of a collapsing of categories. Um, but the Qumran community is a little bit different from that. Um, they have um, at least maybe four distinct conceptions of what a Messiah might be. Um, and and uh, I have some little snippets from, from different pieces of text um, uh, that, that are il illustrative of this. But um, one idea that they might have is about a particular person 
um, who is um, like the anointed one, but he lives at Qumran. So like a living Messiah, a Messiah in the midst. Uh, and this is often connected with the teacher of righteousness uh, or, or the good priest whose enemy is the wicked priest. Um, oftentimes um, these are conflated to be the same person um, by scholars. They may be conflated to be the same person by the Qumran community as well. Um, and then in, in terms of accessing more biblical categories about the Messiah, um, uh, one uh, category is the idea of a, a future anointed priest from the priestly line of Aaron. So showing uh, you know, that the, the coming um, anointed one it will be an anointed priest, a high priest. And this is a particularly um, useful idea at Qumran because we know about their sensitivities or sensibilities around uh, the temple uh, system. And um, so it, in, if they imagine themselves as a community that were priestly and are now in exile and that the, the current establishment is wicked, the idea of an anointed priest is, is actually even more interesting to them than an anointed king. Um, and then from the Deuteronomist's view of history and, and from the prophets, obviously, um, we have the idea of an anointed king, a king that is in the succession of King David. Um, and we have to remember like uh, the significance of this category as well uh, in the present um, history of Israel. So um, at the time of the scrolls, um, the Romans uh, are uh, directly governing um, the, the, air, the region through an appointed governor, basically a procurator um, who is appointed by the governor of Syria um, and uh, it's governed, it's ruled as part of, part of the larger province of Syria. Um, but uh, that, um, that direct rule from Rome takes the place of a, a, a king in the Herodian line, a, you know, a family of Idumean uh, royalty that's friendly to the Romans. Uh, who in turn take the place of the Maccabees. The last Maccabean uh, priest uh, king is killed and the Herodians take over. And so there has been um, regime changes multiple times in the, in the preceding century or so, but none of those regimes have really represented a king in the, in the line of the old Israelite monarchy that fell into disuse with the Babylonian exile. Uh, and so I think part of the hope is that somebody from that, like a restoration of that line of David would restore both earthly rule uh, and God's favor on the, on the political apparatus. And then finally, um, as we see a wide variety of concepts become um, idealized in a, in a Platonic sense in the Hellenistic period, uh, the Messiah can, can, becomes kind of a heavenly or divine figure as well. And we have evidence uh, for that kind of integration with ideas at Qumran as well. So let's take a look at um, just a couple of ideas um, where people might see connections with uh, early Christianity. Um, uh, so one is in this, the, the idea of what we call the virgin birth. Um, the narratives about the birth of Jesus in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke um, suggest that uh, Jesus's mother Mary became pregnant by the Holy Spirit by a kind of a divine process and, and not totally explained what that process is. Um, but uh, that idea is common to two of the four Gospels and is widely believed by Christians of the second century and, and down till uh, today. Um, that is, um, as unusual of an idea as it is to us. And, you know, it, it, it was as challenging to the scientific sensibilities of, um, people in the first century as it is to us, they knew where babies came from. And so this idea was, um, uh, an unusual idea and somewhat of a literary one, one that they would know about maybe the births, know about from the births of gods in the Greco-Roman Roman world and not really from, um, from Jewish um, literary tradition. So uh, nobody 
is uh, conceived this way in the in the um, in the Hebrew Bible, for example, or really in even in any of the other um, uh, Second Temple literature. Um, but nonetheless, there are there are a couple of of connections to be made here. Um, the the text that I have put um, up at the top, I've actually put uh, the original text beneath it. Um, so this is a prophecy um, from uh, the Gospel of Matthew, from the first chapter of the Gospel of Matthew, that um, all Christians um, or most Christians who are, are, are churchgoers would be hearing right about this uh, time of year in a church, because this is the text that people are reading this particular uh, week and, and next week in, in churches um, about um, the, the coming birth of Jesus and um, uh, uh, the Matthew uh, interprets, he, he does a sort of a midrash on this passage from Isaiah um, that uh, uh, there's a little bit of a sleight of hand going on with the language here. Um, if you're not familiar with this sort of sleight of hand, um, uh, the text in the, that Matthew gives us says the virgin, that is to say the, a woman who hasn't, hasn't been with a man, um, shall be with child and she'll bring forth a son and and this is uh, me meant to be a messianic uh prophecy um that that word for virgin comes from the greek version of the hebrew bible come the the septuagint uh, talked a little bit about the septuagint during our bible week but that we talked about differences between the hebrew text and the and the and the greek text this is like a key difference in the hebrew text and the greek text and matthew seems to know the Greek text here, and he seems to be treating this somewhat as a, as a prophecy um, uh, that that he's going to interact with. Um, the original text for Isaiah, uh, which I put underneath it, uh, the word there is just the word um, Alma, uh, which is a young woman. It has nothing to do with sexuality, um, and just a young woman. This this prophecy is not a prophecy about even um, the messianic age in the in the original context of of Isaiah. Um, uh, but what we do see um, in uh, the Thanksgiving hymns uh, from Qumran, this, and we know uh, we discussed this last week, is really kind of angels and demons, kind of Qumran sectarian literature that they have, um, they, they don't um, have a miraculous birth story as part of their, um, you know, theology, but they are also you, juxtaposing this idea of of um, of a of a conspicuous birth, maybe not a miraculous birth, uh, but a conspicuous birth, with the idea of uh, uh, the Messiah from other chapters in Isaiah. So, um, I point all of this to point out just uh, just to say um, this is a, an interpretive move that different communities make with the scrolls. Um, so, if you want to see a parallel with the gospels and early Christianity here, you can see it. Um, and th this is, uh, this kind of, you know, motivates people to maybe draw an artificial connection with Christianity through the lens of this particular prophecy. Um, uh, but uh, it does kind of teach us about what people are looking for in the scrolls too. So there seems to be a recurring theme of everything from early searches and early interpreters to, con to uh, you know, unconventional theories to conspiracy theories to even forgeries uh, is to um, uh, suggest or promote um, these connections or, or missing links. It's interesting that almost nobody tries to make um, uh, conspiratorial missing links between um, the Essenes and um, other forms of early Judaism, um, whether it's, you know, uh, the, the temple cults or something like that. Um, it's always like the, the conspiratorial trajectory is usually a trajectory through um, hidden knowledge or Gnostic knowledge about early Christianity. Um, just to look at another, um, uh, and I'm going to have a couple of examples of these connections here. Um, this is a, um, a connection that I, I would call sort of the Messiah's table connection. Um, and here there is actually, um, a, a, again, a, a, an interesting parallel, um, but then the, the, this interesting parallel might also have a more reasonable explanation. So I'll, I'll kind of walk through 
uh, this for a second. Um, this is um, a passage from the first letter of Paul to the Corinthians in the New Testament, one of the oldest pieces of material in the New Testament. Um, so this is a, as even as New Testament stuff goes uh, super old and sort of authentically second temple material, which most of the New Testament is not. Um, but this is, a, you know, a Paul transmitting um, his recollection of G the, what we call the Last Supper in Christianity, in which Jesus uh, is sharing a meal with his disciples in a particular room in Jerusalem on the night which he's going to ultimately uh, be arrested for his um, his crimes in the garden and and be you know then be tried and, and put to death. Um, and he does some kind of a some kind of a ritual with a cup and and bread and wine, and he he blesses the the bread and wine. Um, and so, and then he gives a kind of a very Christian, you know, interpretation of it. Um, but um, the act of like the Messiah presiding over a, a, a banquet and sharing bread and wine is an idea that's actually shared uh, at the core of the Qumran uh, community as well, because in the text, um, uh, uh, the mess, what we call the Messianic Rule, 1QSA, one of those rules that we talked about uh, for how the how the Qumran community lives, they have this same idea that somehow the Messiah, when he uh, comes, uh, will preside over bread and wine and utter a blessing over it at at the table. Again, a little bit um, a, a little bit uh, unusual of a connection because um, we we don't necessarily always see. We don't see the Messiah necessarily uh, in in in, in a, the sort of the Davidic king sense as somebody who is like a servant that's that's maybe serving bread and rye. Aaron, did you have a question? Yeah, uh, yep. you can hear me, right? So, yes. uh, when what's the date of this letter compared to when the Kumaran community existed? Is it afterwards? Um, it's during same time, um, so it's contemporary. Same time, yeah. So the the I I would put the letter. Um, probably, um, I, this is, I'm guessing, I, I don't know, I would have to look at the best scholarship for this. I'm guessing it's probably around 45 of the common era. Okay. Could be a little bit older, but when I say, a, a, excuse me, a, yeah, a little bit older. Um, it could be like as early as 40, but it's in a fairly narrow uh, time window. Um, so Paul, um, he, come, he comes to Jerusalem maybe in the early 50s of the common era and then he's put to death at least the tradition goes from before the second temple is destroyed um so they are overlapping with each other um but your question is a good question because we don't really know exactly when the date of the messianic rule is um so um the uh the scroll itself is probably from the early first century of the common era, but the community is a little bit older than that. And we, we know um, that the community is destroyed by an earthquake right before um, the advent of the common era and that they rebuild the community. Uh, and so um, we, they, they exist maybe a little bit earlier. Uh, Yair, did you have a hand? Just to say that there's a few people adding comments in the in the chat area. Oh, okay. Yeah, I um, cannot see talking the chat. about blessing wine and bread every Friday evening. That's Andy and Lynn. Yes, it makes me think that he took a typical Friday night kiddush and grafted onto it his messi messianic agenda. Um. Yeah. I. The, I guess the only. Um... The only qualification that and I will just say this one thing and then I will get Andy's question. I think the only qualification that I would put on that comment, which is a very astute comment, is that somebody did it. We don't even know if Jesus did it, right? It, it could be that an author is making a rhetorical move using rituals or, or traditions uh, that, that he knows about here as well. Uh, and so that's a perfect example of how like, if you want to look at this through a New Testament lens, you can say, oh, this is an obvious parallel, and then overlook um, ritual contexts that make sense for the broader Jewish world, including uh, Shabbat and also Passover, right? So these are also 
uh, the you know the sort of the festival context is is another potential context as well. And but Andy, did you have a question as well? Well, uh, I'm being cynical, and of course, Jews love to be cynical about Christian practices and beliefs. I don't want to pile on too much, but no Jew would ever think up the idea of drinking somebody's blood. That's what I want to say. <laughs> um, well. <laughs> It's, uh, I, I get what you're saying, but um, Paul is, uh, is a Jew that thought of that idea. So um, he's, Paul has some very strange ideas though. And, and uh, um, uh, yeah, so this is, uh, you're, you're correct to point out there's a quite um, um, antinomian uh, is maybe a good word uh, here, move here, right? So this is a totally contradicts um, the law as we would, um, would interpret it probably pr pretty much anybody would interpret it. I mean, even it even contradicts um, the the covenant with Noah after the flood, right? You won't drink, you don't drink blood in the. It's one of the, the like the seven things that have rattled off that you don't do even like just as a human being in the the covenant with Noah after the rainbow in, in, the, in um, Genesis uh, Genesis eight or nine. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's a, a very a very. Uh, very astute observation as well. Um, but yes. again, there is kind of this, there is this tenuous connection of drinking and doing a blessing on, on, on food and wine. But as anyone, as, as has been pointed out a couple of times, people bless bread and wine. That's part of the, part of the ritual practice of, of just a, of, of living in a, in a family context, never mind like a community context in the, in the uh, yep, Lynn. Yeah, so I'm reading right now a historical novel about these sort of 18th century pseudo messiahs. And this notion of taking off on what Andy said that no Jewish person would think about eating human blood or eating human flesh, that it, it's just, it's, it, you know, if you just think about it to us, it would be an abomination to use an obsolete word. And so in these messianic, these fake messiahs did all kinds of things that the people of the time thought were abominations. In, in an attempt to create their own cults. And you might even think our current cult leader today wants to throw out the constitution that most of us revere. You know, I, hopefully that cult won't go anywhere, but, but you know, this, this seems like it's all of a piece. The Jews life was pretty, Jewish life were pretty wretched at the time when these- Yeah, yeah. so um, the communities that you're, you're talking about, um, uh, Gershom Sholem, um, who was an early 20th century a master scholar of, of Judaism, one of the early professors at Hebrew University. Um, uh, he, he talks about this kind of antinomianism and, and it's, uh, um, it's almost like um, uh, um, what's the right term for it? Um, it's, it's like demonstrating your um, like your, your righteousness or your authority by sinning. You know, like it's it's like redemption through sin. I think is the term that Sholem uses. Um, and uh, you know, one of my colleagues, uh, e e Emily, um, I think Yara knows Emily, um, is actually right. She, this is a subject that she writes on. Um, so I talked to her a lot about it. That's that's the source of my knowledge of these 17th and 18th century figures like uh, um, Shabbatai Zvi and and Frank and and. Uh, that's those sort of thing, but um, yeah, there's this a phenomenon with messiahs is that they, um, they they do have kind of an antinomian bent to them, and if you think about it, being a messiah itself is kind of an antinomian move. That's not like the trajectory of um, uh, daily like quotidian Judaism uh, is is not to be a messiah. It's usually um, <laughs> some with well, this. Uh, a good deal more, more humility than than that um, potentially. Um, yep, I have two two hands. Um, I don't see whose hands they are. I'm sorry, I sorry. I believe okay. Reva is trying to raise her hand. Yeah, yeah. Can I say something? Um, sure. We we as Reformed Jews might say the mozi and and a blessing over the wine only on Friday night, if then. But but that wouldn't have been the only time. I mean, even Orthodox Jews now would probably also always say a mozi over the bread and maybe always say a, a blessing over wine if they were having it. 
it's not just a Sabbath practice. That's all. I just wanted to squeeze that in. Yeah, so the, I guess um, that that kind of moves the example even more into the realm of of deritualizing, de right? So uh, it may be just describing not even a ritual, as we might call it with religious studies, but just a practice, like people pr say their prayer before they they drink wine or at every meal or something like that. So thank thank you. Did we have another hand? I, I thought that I might have seen two. I think that's it. Okay. Um, so I'm going to move on from this one. Um, uh, this is a good discussion that we're having about the, the um, oh, so Areev? No, I, 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 I was doing it both in the, in oh, the chat okay. And, okay. And, and with my hand, so I had to stop them both. All right. Um, uh, so, um, so some other, um, so another uh, set of parallels here um, is um, this sort of uh, what we would call sort of the messianic signs or the signs of the messianic age um, is uh, also um, uh, a parallel um, that uh, is drawn between um, particular um, New Testament passages and particular texts from Qumran. Um, so this is, I, I threw in an example here from, did I not even say? That's from Matthew 11. Um, I didn't put... Uh, uh, the quotation uh, the, or the citation for it, but um, uh, this is um, a, a, a one of the ways that um, the Christian readers are supposed to understand that the Messianic age is coming through the activity of John the Baptist and Jesus is this um, fulfillment of this passage from Isaiah 61 1 um, that basically the blind receive sight and the lame walk the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is, is proclaimed to the poor. Um, and we do find in a, in a single text from Qumran, which has been termed the Messianic Apocalypse or the Resurrection Text, um, this, this passage that I put down here, the heaven and earth will obey the Messiah, for the Messiah will hear the wounded, revive the dead, and bring the good news to the poor. Um, and I wanted, wanted to highlight this text for two reasons. Um, one is, is, is to just, um, again, think about the motivations that interpreters have. Um, and, uh, you know, a Messiah that resurrects people from the dead or a Messiah that is resurrected from the dead is kind of a Christian um, conception we think historically, we know how that developed in early Christianity, and so it's not an idea floating around in in uh, in other forms of Judaism, but it, like an innovation in the Jewish in the uh, Jesus movement in response to his death. Um, and so, um, if you go looking for these parallels, again, you might you know get lucky and find them. But I also like to. Um, uh, just take a step back and do a little bit of a meta-analysis of some of the language that even scrolls scholars use. Um, so uh, it's one thing to have a fragment called something like uh, archivalist like 4Q521 um, and to have it contain the Hebrew uh, text that is, um, is on the screen before us. But oftentimes... We, you know, we can't access that unmediated fragment, um, and so we we get it through the lens of scholars and translators. And so, when a translator or a scholar makes the move to call a fragment with these words on it a messianic apocalypse or a resurrection text, that is itself a kind of a Christian interpretive move um, that uh, scholars are now um, starting to push back a little bit on. And I know uh, I uh, I got some grief in uh, our our earlier session um, where I was using translations from uh, the the Roman Catholic um, uh, very erudite scholar of the scrolls uh, Geyser Vermesh, uh, but somebody who still has these sorts of biases, um, and even like the choice to um, express the text in. Um, a biblicizing form of language is itself an interpretive move that may not, sometimes the text matches the Bible quite closely, but 
if you uh, render something in a kind of a King James English or a pre-1917 JPS um, sort of English, we're actually trying to, we're making something that may not be there in some cases. So that whenever we talk about the messianic apocalypse or something like that, it's also important to note that this, the scholar is making a, a rhetorical move here in their interpretation of, of the data as well. Um, but uh, uh, some information or, or some, some uh, conceptualization of, of the Messiah that is on more solid footing um, is this, these uh, frequent references that we get to a branch of David or um, a shoot of David. Um, and uh, uh, th this is found in a variety of, of Qumran uh, texts. Um, the War Scroll, um, the uh, the Pesher on Isaiah, uh, the Pesher on Genesis uh, forty nine, um, and uh, this text, small text that we call the the uh, Messianic Florilegium. Um, but what's interesting about the Messianic Florilegium here is it does give us um, something different from the Christian conceptualization. So they are imagining imagining. Um, not just a, a, an anointed king from the, from the line of David or an anointed um, priest from the line of Aaron, but somebody who is an authoritative interpreter of the law who will interpret the law in the end time. And um, if you remember our, our segment on law at Qumran, this fits with their conception of the law, um, that the law of Moses is uh, something that is in need of uh, not um, uh, rabbinic uh, disputation or um, uh, dis you know disposal um, uh, you know or you know sort of being set aside uh, as as the, the early Christians will do or you know philosophizing and and allegorizing as the Alexandrian Jews will do um, but instead something that like needs a, needs and a, needs a, a prophet to interpret uh, correctly. And so they, they're the in this in this like very fragmentary text we call the Messianic Florilegium, um, we get the what we think is the the most authentic Essene or Qumran sense of the Messiah, and that's somebody that will potentially have uh, an, be an authoritative interpreter of the law. Um, Aaron, do we have any evidence other than the fact that it's a, that it was a celibate community that that they thought that this Messianic age was coming soon? Or did they think it was a distant? Uh... Um, they, they the the best evidence that we have for them thinking it's coming soon um, is their pesher on Hab Habakkuk, uh, uh, the the that's the very minor prophet uh, prophetic text of Habakkuk, and they write in their interpretation of Habakkuk a, um, a they write themselves into the story. But they write themselves into a story using some very precise language around um, the Roman um, government of the day, and so it, it it's um, it's not um, a perfect like. And we wrote this in the year seventy nine C.E. sort of thing, um, not that that kind of um, you know Herodotus Thucydides kind of history, um, but it is like very like like. The allegory is so telegraphed that any and so even an ordinary reader, I think, could figure out that they are talking about the Roman occupation of Judea in the beginning of the Common Era, uh, and then they they imagine that the war is going to break out like at a moment in that in that period. So yeah, um, now it is. Um, uh, I do want to point out um, that that's we don't know exactly when that was written, but that could be the last stage of Qumran thinking as well. We don't know if they always thought that. That might be um, that they had a more conventional, in you know, in the by and by kind of eschatology um, before some certain date, and then they came to believe. That this is often something we see with new religious movements too. Um, that they either start in kind of an end time scenario or they end up in an end time scenario for different reasons. And this seems to be a group that has ended up in an end time scenario after 
a more conventional origin as sort of dissident priests in the in the in the temple. I am interpreting a little bit here, but this is um, I think it's still fairly solid um, uh, that that's that's the sensibility. Does that make sense? Yeah. So yeah, great question. Um, I am Alice. Ellis, did you have a question? I'm I'm wondering if it's it's just a stretch to think that the Jesus movement's um, emphasis on the Messiah might also be a response to the Roman occupation. The way kind of this this notion of a a branch of David was somehow a response to the threat of the Roman occupation. Yeah, that... it's 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 a great question. Um I, I think I, I kind of follow the thinking of Paula Fredrickson here, um, who was actually a professor at BU some time ago, um is a more kind of world famous scholar of the historical Jesus, um, who thinks that the that the idea that Jesus is the Messiah emerges only after the body is missing. Like that, that the body is missing for some reason, um, and that that's their evidence that the mess that the resurrection is happening, and and then their next move is oh the resurrection is happening, he must have been the Messiah. That's Paula Fredrickson's thinking, um, and it's it is of all the ideas that have been thrown out, uh, that's the one that I think resonates the best with me. Um, uh, I yeah, but that's. Um, there's a lot of ink that's been spilled on that on that subject over the <laughs> over the years. Um, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, so I wanted to move. Um, so now that we kind of know what the evidence is, I wanted to just kind of move into a little bit of the co a conversation about some of the overreaching um, theories uh, that people have, and I'll have to cover these briefly because I do want to get to the Copper Scroll and and some other cool things that are like on solid footing. Um, but one theory that, that uh, is, is, was put out by um, John Allegro, and John Allegro was one of the prominent early like archeologists of the scrolls. Um, so not just somebody out there in the, you know, in the interpretive ether, but somebody who actually dug some of the material out of the ground himself. Um, he came to the idea that um, maybe the Essenes um, originated a lot of the ideas um, that uh, uh, come to be present in early Christianity. and But then the Christians, as we know them from the New Testament, are interpreters who misunderstand kind of the esoteric um, and Gnostic ideas of the Essenes. They literalize them, and that's how they end up, we, how we end up with Christianity. And that it, it, that there was no um, Jesus um, per se. He was a fictional character um, that is developed through this uh, interpretive move. Um, I should say a little bit about Allegro was also into um, uh, hallucinogenic plants and, and mushrooms. And he had a lot of ideas about fallen angels himself. Uh, and so he was kind of ridiculed out of the academy, um, unfortunately, um, due to his unusual ideas about um, psychedelics and and um, the potentially the role that psychedelics played in the development of of second temple uh, religion, but that this uh, this is an idea that you will often find in the in the conspiratorial world of of the Travel Channel and and Netflix and that sort of thing is that is you know was Jesus real or was he like a a, a figure from a fictionalized figure from uh, from this kind of an origin. Um, as proof that you could take the same evidence and go in the exact opposite direction with it, um, another common conspiracy uh, theory or, or un, uh, exceptional theory about the origins of the, the scrolls and, and Christianity is that um, actually the Essenes were the early Jesus movement um, and uh, that the brother of Jesus was the head of the Essenes and, um, and that they produced all of this um, uh, material that is, of course, being kept secret from us um, because of conspiracies within the Roman Catholic world uh, to suppress the uh, controversial or the revolutionary nature of that. And this is another very, very common 
um, a conspiratorial move that you'll find in interpreting the scrolls is that people will, um, when they can't find what they want in the scrolls, they will imagine that there's more or different stuff that's been hidden away, destroyed, it's locked in the Vatican archive, um, that sort of thing. That is a c common rhetorical conspiratorial move that we find in interpreting the scrolls is whenever we don't find um, exactly what we want in the scrolls, then it must be that, you know, uh, nefarious powers have, have conspired to keep that uh, from us. Um, and um, I do want to point out that, um, you know, it's not completely, um, uh, it, 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 the, the theories often have no basis in fact, but the, the, um, the affect behind them um, does have some, some basis in reality. And I talked briefly about this, I think, in, in, in session one, um, but one of the things that fed many of the conspiracy theories um, early on and left us with kind of a mess as interpreters uh, 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 and, and um, you know, public scholars on the scrolls is that um, for a period uh, uh, in the 60s and 70s, the content of the scrolls was largely controlled by a small number of people led by a Dominican monk named Roland DeVoe. Um, and it, it turns out uh, most of us now, I think, believe DeVoe was uh, just more of a control freak and not really a conspiratory conspiracy theorist. Um, but the conspiratorial mind says, you know, Roman Catholic monk working in secrecy, Vatican, secret Vatican archives, you know, at the same moment when this is happening is also the moment of the opening of the Vatican archives to scholarship and public uh, knowledge after a, a long period of secrecy during the First and Second World Wars. And so ironically, actually, the opening of the Vatican archives, uh, which was done by Pope Paul VI um, in the in the uh, uh, in the seventies, early seventies, um, was something that actually motivated people to imagine the scrolls were hidden there before nobody knew about the archives or what was in them or anything like that. So nobody was really concerned. But this happens at precisely the moment when a wide wide variety of of Catholicism related conspiracies are emerging in popular culture in the Europe and the United States, and there's a, books like Holy Blood and Holy Grail and and those sorts of things are, are sources for the overall conspiratorial sensibility about the scrolls. And it's, that is also a, a trope that you will find frequently kind of repeated in popular literature and film about the scrolls. Um, to uh, illustrate my point I just had, I have one screenshot from Forbidden History on the Discovery Channel that's running right now um, that, uh, uh, gives kind of exactly this this interpretation, but it's quite uh, uh, unsupported um, uh, that there's a connection that, you know, scrolls, Vatican conspiracy, kept top secret. And one of the things that's, uh, that's being kept top secret uh, is a treasure map, which is going to take us into our conversation about the Copper Scroll. Um, so um, just some basic facts about the Copper Scroll. Um, it is a copper scroll, first of all. It's not like it's not a misnomer or a or a, a, a con, you know con, it's just it is, it is a rolled up piece of copper. Um, it's found in 1952 in secure archaeological context. That means uh, that people were in, engaging in controlled archaeological excavation with notebooks and cameras and um, you know taking their levels and their measurements from the uh, base, you know. You know, some some kind of a be benchmark, um, and uh, they discovered it, it through those means, uh, and that's significant because many of the scrolls, even some of the scrolls that we love and cherish most, like the War Scroll or or the Community Rule, come through the antiquities market, and we don't exactly know how they're found. But the Copper Scroll, we do know exactly how it's found. It's found in Cave Three. Um, we have a photo of it in situ. That's a photo of it while it's before anybody picked it up on the floor in cave three. Um, what is it? It's a single eight foot long scroll. Um, it's made out of a 98% copper, 1% tin with some impurities. Um, and it is, a, what, what does it say? It's in Hebrew text, a, a, a Mishnaic dialect of Hebrew text. Um, 
and uh, it uh, so it's like a, a late second temple dialect, and it describes the locations of 64 different deposits of treasure that almost certainly are meant to be the treasure from the temple in Jerusalem. There is a dissenting theory from that, um, but I will say something about that in just a moment. It actually, it really raises more questions than answers. Who made it? Why is it, why is it, in there? Like, why is it even in there? This, the rest of this is a library of like biblical texts and interpretation of Bible and rules for a mon mon monastic community. And this is like a treasure map made out of metal. Um, and then of course, the most important question, is the treasure real, right? It's like, could you, could you find this treasure? And disappointingly, I think the answer is no, but um, um, just a, a little bit more on the materiality of the Copper Scroll. Um, so it is, was fairly fragile. Um, and so the decision was made uh, in order to read the scroll to simply cut it into hemispherical segments and leave it like in its round shape, but cut it in slices. Um, and then when it was cut in slices, um, the individual slices could in fact uh, be read. And um, uh, to show you how readable it is, uh, this, is a, this is actually a replica um, on modern copper. But it's a it's a um, it's a, a more or less perfect replica of it, I, and you can see uh, even on copper, um, the uh, the Hebrew is quite uh, readable here. Um, so people have been able to kind of figure out what the copper scroll says, and the text of the copper scroll is quite readable as well. I put a um, section of it here, um, and this is like typical. Like every chapter of the copper scroll is basically the same form as this. Um, so at a place called Horabah, we don't always know what the names, we don't always know what the places are. Sometimes we do under the stairs, which go eastwards, 40 cubits. It's like good old fashioned pirate style treasure map here. A box filled with silver weighing 17 talents. Then we, uh, sometimes we have these weird Greek phrases as well. Um, we don't know if this is somebody signing a signature or, or like well, some kind of code. Uh, but anyway, uh, it, it's a, that's a, one of the mysteries. But then... In another place, in a tomb, there's a hundred gold bars. Um, and then in a cistern, which is in the courtyard of the little colonnade at the very bottom, you know, closed with sediment, you know, they like under the mud, there's 900 talents of silver. Um, but then we also sometimes have implements um, or other priestly um, kelim, like tools, like from the, from the um, temple. And so in this particular one, it says at the aphods, the priestly garments, are concealed at the hill of Kohlit, wherever that is, um, at the exit of the canal, you know. So the, the, the ephods and other, like the candlesticks, I think, are somewhere else, um, are strong indicators that this is meant to describe the treasure of the temple treasury itself. Um, um, another hypothesis that people have put forward is that it could be the treasure of the Qumran community, um, but this is a lot of money. Um, and uh, yeah, Aaron. Well, I didn't want to interrupt right in the middle of what you said, but if this is if this could be the treasure from the temple, the Romans supposedly took it. Do they have a list that in any way corresponds to this stuff? Um, they have a they have a little bit of a so we don't have a list from the Romans, but we do have two contemporaneous accounts of it. Um, plus, we have the Arch of Titus, which I, I have a picture of on the next uh, slide. Um, but we do have kind of descriptions. They're not this precise as this. Um, but um, I was just you know I was uh, trying to highlight this is a lot of money. This is not the kind of money that one person probably has or one group of monks in the desert has this is more like the amount of money that a city state has when you total it all up it's like it would be hundreds of millions of dollars in contemporary money so people think that it may be a, a, that meant to be the treasure map um some so just a quick you know rattling off of some of the theories here some people think it is the temple treasure map uh, but that it, the treasure was never stored. 
Um, some people think it's from a previous time. So maybe this is not the treasure map from 67, but maybe it was stored in some other conflict and then it was recovered and uh, came to be possessed in the, in the temple treasury again. Some people think it might be something from Qumran and some people think it may be purely a work of imagination. Um, the evidence against it being purely a work of imagination, man, is it takes a lot of work to, to make 84 feet of copper scroll um, and uh, write words on it that just contain a silly treasure map in this, in this way if, if, if the content is not real. Um, the other thing I wanted to say real quick is we kind of glossed over the Norman Golb theory that these uh, um, Dead Sea Scrolls are the library of the Jerusalem temple. Um, that is a, another alternative uh, theory that is a minority theory, but a, 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 a popular minority theory that is based on a couple of lines of evidence. One is that there's it's a lot of material at, at you know, Qumran, maybe more than a sectarian group might possess. Um, but also, this is a pretty um, interesting piece of evidence that supports Golb's theory, right? If this isn't a treasure map of the of the treasury of the temple, what is it doing with the Dead Sea Scrolls? You know, and, and so um, it, it's uh, it's an it's an interesting question. I don't have an answer for you, unfortunately. Um, it's uh, just a, a a few more um, uh, pieces of information about the Copper Scroll for a second. Uh, this is a map. I had to photograph this map up from a book because I've never been able to find a digital copy of it anywhere. Um, but this is a, a, a map of the, all of the hypothesized locations of uh, the, the treasure a, as much as people can read uh, the, um, read the text. Um, there is one um, uh, 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 there is one passage in the treasure map that seems to suggest that uh, the treasure could be at the bottom of the lake uh, at Ein Karim near Hadassah Hospital on the western side of modern Jerusalem. Um, people have gone and looked specifically at that location. It's one of the best, like easiest to guess locations in the treasure map. And they didn't find hundreds of talents of silver there, unfortunately. Maybe it's still down there. Um, but um, as as others have have, have pointed out, um, there's a lot of contemporaneous historical sources that tell us that the treasure um, from the temple itself was taken to Rome as tribute after its destruction in the Jewish War, um, and the Arch of Titus, um, which um, Anybody can go see, and in, in, it's actually where the ticket booth is to get into the Roman Forum today. Um, anybody can just go go buy a ticket and look up at it, and you can see there's the menorah being carried by members of the Tenth Legion right there on the on the arch. And this is made soon after um, the actual uh, events took place. Uh, and there there are other Roman historical sources that talk about the proceeds. Uh, being used to build the Flavian Amphitheater, the Colosseum, uh, and then other Roman sources that talk about the the sacred artifacts being um, uh, displayed in the Temple of Peace in the Roman Forum. Uh, that's a picture of the Temple of Peace uh, as it stands today in the foreground on the bottom uh, there. The Temple of Peace itself was destroyed by the Vandals, in uh, the 400s of the Common Era, and we think the Vandals stole whatever was left. And there's great conspiracy theories about it. maybe the tre treasure may be in Cosenza, um, it may be in Lombardy. Uh, anyway, it's um, probably gone. Is, is uh, my hypothesis. But anyway, so that's that's kind of the the treasure map story. Um, so I want to finish up our last couple of segments just talking about. Um, uh, uh, some of the scandals surrounding fake Dead Sea Scrolls and forgeries that have emerged just in the last um, decade and even more recently, in the, maybe in the last uh, 24 months or so. Um, so a little bit of a shift of gears here. Um, uh, one object um, that I'm including just because I've done a little bit of my own work on the object, although I have never seen the object, um, I've done um, uh, sort of research uh, in 
secondary literature about it, um, is this object is called the Gabriel Revelation. And the Gabriel Rev Revelation is, um, I'll talk about the text in a second, um, but a good example of like people faking what they wanted to find. And um, I will, like when we don't find um, the right kinds of ideas about early Christianity or Second Temple Judaism in the scrolls, we just make it, make a, we make, we're going to make one instead. <laughs> so it seems to be what has happened with uh, this, this object called the Gabriel Revelation or the Jesselson Stone. Um, it's it's somewhat controversial piece. Um, it is not like the the most telling outright fake, um, it, but it has some issues which I'll I'll, I'll talk about. Um, it shows up on uh, uh, unprovenance, that is to say, nobody knows where it came from. Um, in the um, antiquities market in around the year two thousand. Um, and it enters at some point after that, the private collection of a collector named David Jesselson. Um, he lives in Switzerland. I forget exactly how he made his wealth, something involving Swiss money. And, um, and he is a, one of the largest collectors of, of like Greco-Roman antiquities and in particular Jewish antiquities. Um, but Jesselson buys this thing sight unseen from a vendor. Um, and uh, then he gets scholars um, from Hebrew University to come to Switzerland and read it for him. And so the story goes. And what it contains is like a series of nearly incomprehensible texts. Despite the, the, the letters on the sub being quite legible, it's still, um, the text is still a little bit confusing. Um, and, um, but these don't stop interest in the object initially. And so actually it was displayed in the Israel Museum uh, in 2013 as, as part of an exhibit uh, as an authentic object. Um, the, the work that the Hebrew University scholars had done in the, in the uh, couple of years before that um, were suitable in the mind of, of the Israel Museum to authenticate it to the extent where they put the object on display, they put a translation on display. The translation is actually on the wall right next to it. I kind of cut it out of the picture. Um, but this is kind of how it was displayed in the Israel Museum when it was exhibited about 10 years ago. Um, when I talk about the text and some of the unusual features of the text, as I said, it's almost, um, uh, it's almost incomprehensible despite the letters being relatively easy to read. So. We see kind of frequent, you know, uh, resort to biblical phrases. Thus, he said, uh, the Lord, the Lord of hosts, the Lord of Israel, one, two, three. But then the things that he says to the, the Lord, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Why is it? It's like it's like it does not make does not make a whole lot of sense. And then it pivots to like, what is it? They said the blossom or the diadem. These are like really kind of it's almost like a nonsense text, like a almost like a Lewis Carroll kind of poem uh, that somebody has made in the, in, the, in the form of the Dead Sea Scroll. But, but, but um, there is some, there's some additional oddities here that point us in the, in the direction of suspicion. One is that it, the, the whole thing is like super unreadable, and yet it contains lots of words that Second Temple scholars and people interested in Second Temple Judaism and early Christianity find very interesting and appealing. So it talks about, you know, we have only a couple of lines here, but it talks about Jerusalem multiple times. It talks about the angel Gabriel multiple times. Then it has these like very sneakily uh, kind of incorporated Christian, I, like there will be three signs. And then in three days, something is going to happen with the prince of princes. So it's obscurian. It's like super obscure, but you're supposed to, you have a decoder ring and the decoder ring is, you'll, you know who, the, you know who Gabriel is. You know what three days means. You know what the Prince of Princes means if you read the Second Temple literature of early Christianity. And so it's almost too good to be true in that respect. People who have done very, very erudite textual analysis on this have basically convincingly, I think, demonstrated that this collection of Christianizing ideas, or at least messianic ideas, don't coalesce in this small and this fragmentary and this otherwise un, undecipherable form of text anywhere else in the scrolls. It's like there's too many 
too many clues, too many crossword puzzle clues here for you to find for this to be a normal text that we would find at the Dead Sea. Um, so my own um, work on this has come at it from a completely different angle. Um, I looked um, for a project that I did um, a year or two ago uh, at functionally how this stone Dead Sea Scroll as it's alleged to be worked when we read it in light of other texts written on stones. Um, and um, that's, I, I just thought that's like a, 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 an interesting way to look at it. That, uh, scholars who study texts, like really study um, uh, literature, have lots of theories for literature, but they often like ignore like the material itself, which is some, something I'm more knowledgeable about. So I, I just did some research and a couple of things that I, um, I'm arguing about in favor of forgery on this, on this uh, particular object. One is that the print is kind of small, like maybe one tenth to one twentieth uh, the size of other um, uh, texts that appear on stone objects from, the, th this is a Latin text, but it's a Latin text from Jerusalem from the first century of the common era. Um, and it, we uh, have some good measurements for it. Uh, and it is, um, uh, the letters are much, 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 much bigger. Same thing with texts that are on ossuaries, on bone boxes. People write the names of their loved ones. That usually they're, that's also written on stone. Um, they are much, much, much bigger. Um, there are other problems with this object as well. Uh, one is that it comes in at between 290 and 305 pounds, which is slightly more than a baby elephant. Um, but um, I saw uh, Beth's hand. Uh, Beth, did you have a question? Yeah, yeah, I had a question. Um, it's, it seems that, you know, things that are done in stone would a be bigger because they would be normally displayed on a wall someplace likely. Yeah. Um, and so they have a different purpose than, um, you know, than the text in a scroll. So they, they do. And actually my, my, my uh, baby elephant key, the argument for my baby element, baby elephant here is, um, one of the affordances of a scroll is being able to take it out onto, place it on a table and read it. But this is something that Pete, one person can't even lift, right? So it's like, it's too small to be a sign, but it's too heavy to pick up and read. Um, and you, you probably couldn't be more than, than maybe 40 or so inches away from it uh, and be able to read it at, at all, just kind of by the rules of a, of a, like a standard Snell eye chart. Um, well, Linda, I have another, I have another question. Again, getting back to the purpose of putting things on stone. Um, presumably they would be something that, you know, somebody walking by would be interested in reading about. Yes. Um, and this kind of mishmash of prophecies doesn't seem like something. It, it does not at all. And it, every, most writing on stone is functional. Like it, it tells you, um, this is the, the so and so built this building, you know. The, so and so is buried; their corpse is under the ground right here, right? Or you know, um, uh, so the, you know, they, they're usually dedicatory in, inscriptions and military inscriptions, tombstones, that sort of thing. They are not usually esoteric religious texts. In fact, this may be like one of a kind in that regard. Um, I did see another hand. I wanted to make sure that I didn't lose somebody that was interested in asking a question. I believe that's Lynn. Yeah, just I'm sorry if I'm, this is a stupid question. The photograph that you're showing on there looks like it's in Latin. Yes. Um, and so, you know, the people that were living in, in Qumran, really, I assume they hated the Romans. Why would they, if it was really them that wrote it, why would they write it in Latin? Oh, the, the so the Qumran community did not write the stone that's on yeah, the Yeah, why, why would something presumably written by some Roman person in tiny little script on a stone, you know, it? yeah, why would it even be there? Um, so let me, um, I, I may have created a little bit of confusion by going too fast here, um, mm -hmm. uh, but so the, the, the stone that is called the Jesselson stone, um, is what's pictured um, kind of at lower resolution on the left-hand side over the baby elephant. 
that text is in Hebrew. Um, and so the, the hypothesis is that the, that is written by the you know, Jews at Qumran. The text that's on the right there is just an example of like what we know writing on stone looks like from Jerusalem. It just happens to be in Latin um, because that was one where I was able to get the measurements on it. So you're kind of finding the gaps in my scholarship here. Um, I, there aren't actually a lot of texts in Hebrew on stone to even take measurements of. This one was one I could actually take measurements of. So I, I, does that make more sense? Yeah, it was not hypothesized that they wrote the, the, the text in Latin. Um, there, there are some Hebrew texts from the te Second Temple that I know have been recovered that were on the like the parapets. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I also think um, the uh, um, the Samaritan Temple in in uh, uh, on Mount Gerizim also has stone texts of uh, stone writing of the Hebrew text, but those would be quite large, yeah. like um, like inches approaching feet in size for the individual letters, I think. Yeah, I, I've, seen, like, I've seen the the stones in Jerusalem and yeah, they're quite large. They're like six or eight inches yeah. high because they were up on the parapet, so. <laughs> yeah, um, so anyway, that's just my own, you know, entry into the into the debate here is that, I, you know, I people have spent a lot of time on the content and didn't really think very much about the object and I wanted to contribute a little bit of my sensibilities about the object, the object is something that needs to be picked up. It needs to be written on. It needs to be read. You know those sorts of things. Um, the last thing that I want to talk about in terms of forgeries is a scandal that's going on right now, um, or maybe has reached its resolution just in the last couple of months, um, and that is um, the uh, purported. Um, 70 new scroll fragments that entered the antiquities market over the last couple of, of decades. Um, so the speculation behind this is that um, you may remember way back to week one, this figure called Kondo, um, who was the antiquities dealer in Bethlehem that first purchased the scrolls from the Bedouin uh, children and also was involved with um, uh, Eleazar Sukanik and uh, his son um, in the uh, process of like transferring the scrolls to the state of Israel. Um, uh, but the, the, again, the theory, the conspiracy theory is that Kondo's family have some scrolls hidden away in a vault in Switzerland or some other place that is beyond the reach of the law, either uh, Israeli antiquities law, Jordanian antiquities law, or the law that could catch up with them. Um, um, there is some evidence to suggest that that is the case. Um, one is that they have actually displayed legitimate biblical fragments to private collectors at different points in the last um, several decades. That Kondo's family, that is Kondo himself, has, has passed away, but his children are still living. Um, and then also one time they they just outright asked 1.2 million on the on the common market uh, for a Genesis fragment, um, and they uh, they I, the American institution that they made the offer to decided that was too expensive, and they didn't want to got, buy it. But along comes Steve Green, self-made billionaire of the Hobby Lobby um, uh, craft chain. Um, he made himself a museum of the Bible in Washington, D.C. It's actually a quite nice museum, um, though not without all kinds of controversies. Um, but there was a time when this museum was getting put up where he just wanted to get everything he could. Uh, and so he became a little bit of a dupe uh, for um, uh, potential forgers, which we'll discover in a second. Uh, and then also some other major Christian institutions also became... Um, dupes in the same, but through the same antiquity stealer. Um, what's pictured on the right there is actually um, a fragment uh, that purported to be a fragment of Dead Sea Scrolls as it was displayed in the Museum of the Bible when the Museum of the Bible opened in 2017. Um, I managed to see the fragments while they were still on display. They are not on display anymore, um, but uh, they've been there. Um, you know, they, they were there at the beginning um, and they claim the claims about the possible 
um, provenance problems and, and possible forgery problems were never made at, at the time that they were displayed. Um, but people who have studied um, these have also suggested uh, that they are too good to be true. Um, um, here are a couple of arguments as to why um, they, they are probably too good to be true. Uh, one is that the material that was presented uh, represents an abundance of biblical, clear, highly legible biblical material. Now, if you remember when we talked about what is what's at Qumran, we said only about a third of the fragments uh, that have been found uh, are biblical. They're all mostly the sectarian type of texts and, and other texts, other Second Temple texts. But it seems like most of these fragments are like really good Bible fragments. Um, and that's and not a perfect argument for forgery. I mean, there are Bible fragments from Qumran, and it's possible to put lots of them in a bucket or a basket and offer them for sale. Um, but uh, at the same time, it does test um, the statistical uh, probabilities a little bit to suggest that they are all biblical material. Um, but then when people looked at them, people who really, really know fragments, um, they found started to find some other problems as well. Um, what they everybody I think agrees that the medium, like the the writing, the writing material is authentically ancient. But people who know about ancient leathers and leather preparing processes have argued uh, that it is more consistent with apparel leather than it is with writing materials. So apparently, you don't. I'm not an expert on leather working of either kind, but apparently, you don't um, uh, prepare writing materials and leather for the soles of shoes in the same ways. Um, that's a picture of actual shoes from somewhere in ancient Israel. Um, I can't remember that. I don't know if they're from Qumran or not, but they are. Uh, those are authentically Second Temple shoes over there. Um, uh, there are other uh, challenges as well. Um, some people have argued that they think that they see evidence of uh, an intentional aging process using modern glue, like Elmer's, Elmer's glue kind of glue, um, as a way of making the, their uh, uh, scrolls acquire a particular patina that is um, uh, uh, indicative of authenticity. Uh, and then people who have looked at them under a microscope have also suggested that the way that the ink um, is applied to the scrolls um, is consistent with it being applied to a leather that is already old. So remember when we looked at our picture way back at the beginning of how they made them, you have the one guy just kind of making the parchment you know, on the table and then handing it to the other guy who inscribes the scroll. There is not a very long life cycle between uh, the death of the sheep and the creation of the manuscript. Um, but that is not the um, not the evidence uh, that is found in these um, uh, materials that have emerged on the market in the late 20th, early 21st century. Um, instead, it's, it seems like it's written on something that's already old. Um, and the lesson here, I think the overall lesson of both the Jesselson Stone and the, the parchment forgeries uh, is that where there is a market for these materials, there will be forgeries. Uh, if somebody's willing to pay for new scrolls, um, then the, somebody is willing to go along and, and invent some new scrolls for them. And that's, uh, yep, Alice. I'm wondering why um, or maybe this is obvious, but um, the fact that uh, these um, basically a Christian organization would put so much value in a uh, piece of material that um, that might be connected to um, kind of this period of time or. or in other words, are they are they trying to show or that um, Christianity has this this ancient root in in the? As I think scrolls, um, that... I think that they're they're trying to do a couple of things. I, I've done a little bit of my own work on um, the project of the Museum of the Bible, um, and uh, I think there there's there's a couple of motivations here one is kind of a supersessionist motivation i would call it they're um trying to claim ancient israel for themselves 
like in an almost in an exclusive sense. Like, like think about, I mean, it's it's kind of hard to get a, get your mind around an abstract concept like this, but tr tr try to imagine like staking a claim on the ancient the ownership of ancient Israel as a category really belongs to evangelical Christians. It doesn't belong to Jews and it doesn't belong to other kinds of Christians. And so they're like, they're make, they're, so first of all, they're staking that kind of claim. It's an interpretive claim and it's also a, 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 a hegemonic claim that they're making a, like an authoritarian, authoritarian kind of a claim. Um, the other thing is that um, the, uh, and maybe this is actually a good transition to the next slide. Um, the, um, they want to um, like this something about owning stuff, and because of the way that the stuff is taken out of the ground and has been taken out of the ground over the centuries, um, uh, the state of Israel and um, to a lesser extent um, um, the kingdom of Jordan um, uh, uh, are the possessors of these materials, and so if you don't agree with their presentation or even with the uh, the basic idea of their continued ownership of that cultural heritage, then you go out and you try to collect for yourself. Um, and um, so th those are, I think, some of the motivations. Um, but I also, um, I just want to, I want to call all of that into question with our just kind of final thought uh, for the course. And that is, okay, we have these scrolls um, and we have other artifacts. Who do they belong to? And just, just oh, I, to ask that question in order to highlight the different kinds of communities that lay claim to the scrolls. I mean, one is one, one kind of community that lays claim to them is the, the community of world heritage. So this is um, even like projects like UNESCO. Um, you know, it, to what extent are the do, the do the scrolls belong to everybody? They belong to um, uh, the um, you know the project of of human civilization and and all you know all the people. Um, as time moves on, we are beginning to see um, more clearly the colonial Western colonial um, agenda that lies beneath uh, that that rhetoric, but nonetheless, it's still a very popular rhetoric that these kinds of things belong to everyone. Um, and uh, so that's one kind of a claim that people make. Um, obviously, um, the state of Israel has a claim uh, that it makes, that this is the cultural heritage of Israel. It has good reasons for that claim. Um, it's, it it's authentically comes out of the ground in, you know, in, the, in the regions of the world that are under Israeli control. Um, but there's also like a, a more ideological um, uh, piece there, which is that these these things come into discovery at the precise moment where the state of Israel is born, uh, and so they become part of the um, uh, the the material accoutrements of the birth of the state of Israel in the same way that I'm, I'm not meant to, not meaning to trivialize, but like you know Betsy Ross's flag or George Washington's false teeth or any of like to think about the colonial uh, the artifacts of colonial America um this is an uh, this is our artifacts associated with the birth of rebirth of a modern nation and it just so happens that they also tell the story of another time um where there are strong cultural parallels between the situation in in the present and the past at least in the minds of of certain categories of interpreters um, that of course raises the question of what, what is the place of um, uh, the Jordanians who possess some of the material, and what is the place of the Palestinians who lay legal claim to um, the areas of the West Bank, some of the areas of the West Bank where the caves are found. Uh, the, um, the area, the Qumran National Park itself is in Area C, um, but there are other parts of the cave that maybe are within Palestinian control. So do they have a claim on the scrolls? No, I don't know that they're the, – the, I think the consensus, the cultural consensus is that they're not really that interested in possessing uh, proof of Jewish antiquity in, in the Holy Land. Um, but uh, that's, a, that's an oversimplification, but, but not, a, not an incorrect one. Um, so that's, that's kind of the, the national kind of form of who, who does this belong to? Um, and then there's also the question about um, uh, the interactions and, and, and the, um, 
uh, uh, even the possession of the material by different communities. Uh, so, so the communities of scholars, uh, as we saw uh, early on, particular kind of uh, scholar hoarded the materials to the exclusion of everybody else. So should they all be open? What rights do people have to the like, exclusivity of their work? These are questions that scholars like to ask in their own kind of in their ivory towers. Um, there's also a question about the roles of the role that museums have. You know, are museums responsible for displaying everything? Are they responsible for displaying everything responsibly, capturing all of the nuances of provenance and historical contingency and um, dis disagreeing? points of view and other interpretations and those sorts of things. And when we get an object like the Jesselson stone that is just decontextualized from its origin and put on display, we may create a false narrative in the, in the minds of the public. Um, and then there's also the question of private collectors. Like, should anybody have the right to own these things? What do they belong to? Um, do they belong to the world? Do they belong to Israel? Do they belong in a museum? Well, if those, if any of those things are true, do they belong in the scholarly community? Then do I have a right to hoard them in my home, in my safe in Switzerland, or my, uh, you know, my my university, um, you know, a board of trustees dining room, or you know, any of these places that uh, f bits and pieces of the these objects are are still to be found. Um, yeah, Aaron, did you have a question? I had a question. Has all the content been extracted already? Or there's still scrolls that are uninterpreted and unopened. There are fragments that are uninterpreted and un unopened, but most of those fragments contain three or fewer letters. Um, so most of the stuff that is readable uh, uh, it has been found. Um, some of the material is actually lost as well. So um, I'm friends on Twitter with a scholar from Norway named Arsen Usnes. And he works a lot on forgery, but he also works on lost materials. And every day he posts a new piece of material that's lost, that we have a photograph of, but nobody knows uh, where it is. So, so, so there's some, some things that are lost as well. I am, uh, I've reached the end of what I'm gonna say. I, 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 I did see some other hands. Uh, was there anybody else who wanted to chime in with the last word? Hi, I'm not sure this should be the last word, but I think it's very interesting. I was thinking how this is a lesson for everybody who's dealing with fake news nowadays, with anti-scientific opinions, because here the public is very interested in what the dead schools mean, and we can't even read the darn things. We depend on the scholars and the experts, and um, this is something to um, that we have to discuss. Because yeah, the experts may be wrong, or they may have their own biases, but we depend on the scientific method. And that's just as true for COVID-19 as it is for the Dead Sea Scrolls. It, it is absolutely true. And this, the community of people that work with the prime materials is, primary materials is quite small as well. So that's subject to its own kind of, of uh, biases and, and, and problems as well. So that's a great, a great observation. Yeah, there's, there is a, a very unambiguous connection between the conspiracies around the scrolls and other, the other families of conspiracy that including anti-Semitic conspiracies, anti-Catholic conspiracies, um, anti-science conspiracies. Um, it's definitely it all is all out, out in the ether. Well, thank you, Scott. It's a great class. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Yari, for putting this together for us. Thank you, everyone. Um, All right. Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, as well. It's been wonderful to have such a great class and a great audience for material that I'm very passionate about. And it's been a pleasure to do this with you guys. So thank you as well.